Hi class, today we're going to be talking about ancient China and as well we're going to be talking about uh, some thesis statements giving a bit more practice as well as thesis statements are going to be crucial in this class. So we'll start with the thesis statement here today and we'll talk about uh, the question here is responding to the statement uh, river valleys were necessary for the development of civilization. When you go and look at the statement you have to kind of think about the connection between uh, how does river valley go and connect to the idea of civilization? How could a, a river valley actually form civilization? And the question here, uh, we have to talk about what makes a civilization a civilization. And this came up as one of your homework questions. And some of the common characteristics that you see, you may see an organized form of religion, uh, a form of writing, uh, different social structures, kind of different social levels, a form of efficient government as well. And this essentially results as a result of an agricultural surplus, meaning that people are not required to be farmers all the time. And with their extra time, you have people that aren't farmers. They can develop other things that we call civilization. So how do river valleys do that? And do they do that? So that's what you have to respond to in this question. So you can basically, in some ways, either agree with it fully, agree with it partially, or, or, or disagree with the statement completely. When you go in and address this, this prompt, you want to make sure that you don't use the word I, because in the history I say you don't use the word I. It's implied what you are thinking, and you don't want to say something along the lines of I think this. So I'll show you kind of some ways to get around that uh, as we take a look at some, of, some examples of how you would address this thesis statement. So uh, looking at it first here, an example of a weak thesis statement would be basically what we call parody in the prompt. Uh, all civilizations need a river valleys in order to develop culture. That's basically what the prompt said. You're not saying, you're not answering the why. And why did that happen? Um, how did that happen? A slightly better example would be something along the lines of a steady supply of water provided water for irrigation um, for the early civilizations of Egypt, Mesopotamia, and this river valley. So at least you're getting some specific examples of those three civilizations and the connection between irrigation. But th the question is not fully answered there because you're not talking about um, how the irrigation led to th the development of civilization, which we talked about uh, on the previous slide, which discussed the rise of religion, uh, political system, economics, uh, writing as well. And something that's better than, than those two, while the civilizations of Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Indus replied upon rivers for uh, irrigation and transportation, the development of the Olmec did not depend upon the traditional model of river valley. So in the previous four civilizations that we've analyzed, and we're going to have the fifth one today with China, the civilizations of Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Indus, while they're different, they did have that traditional model of a river valley. Olmec, not exactly the same. So you're at least making some form of a distinction. Not a perfect thesis statement, but if we're going in comparison uh, to the other two, we can tell that this is definitely the best. We're getting more descriptive in terms of analyzing the quote. And if you look here, you don't see the word I or I think. And uh, the thing with the thesis statement is it's only one sentence, but it takes a while to come up with. So you're going to have to look at your notes and kind of um, analyze a bit what the question is truly asking. And in order to come with, um, up with a good thesis statement, it takes a, a good deal of practice as well. So today we're going to be talking about ancient China, which will be our final civilization of this unit. And China's quite remarkable just due to the fact that China has existed as a, as a continuous civilization um, as far for thousands of years, essentially. It's been a civilization that's been incredibly isolated, um, and it obviously has had change, but in some ways it hasn't. And uh, you'll see these families that control China, these dynasties, control them for hundreds and hundreds of years, even longer than our, our country's been around. So... Uh, we're going to take a look at China and some of their, uh, the, their special kind of characteristics, uh, which will be pretty interesting as well. So first, let's talk about the G and graves, the good old geography. Um, they develop relatively isolated. One third of, of China is, is mountainous. You also have the Gobi de Desert and the Himalayas surrounding it. And they develop an idea, basically, what we would call as ethnocentrism, which is a belief that you're, basically your culture is better than others. And if you're looking at ancient China, that's very much the case because their culture, if they looked at the barbarians, the people on the outside, uh, they definitely have a more advanced civilization. So they develop in relative isolation, kind of doing their own thing, if you want to think about it along those terms. And as a result of this, they th kind of think they're better. Their two biggest rivers, 
you may have heard them before, are the Yellow and the Yangtze. The Yellow River is a little bit shorter than the Yangtze. It is known as both China, China's Sorrow and China's Pride. Uh, China's Sorrow because of the, uh, the flooding of the river, which would go and cause a lot of destruction, but also the Pride because a lot of civilizations built off the river. The, the name of the Yellow River comes from the mineral, mineral deposits in the river uh, as a result of the rocks. Uh, they Basically, when the rock, water runs over it, it forms a yellow substance. And then the Yangtze River, which is another dependable river. And from this, uh, we have the development of the ancient Chinese civilization, which we're going to take a look at today. Looking at the concept of dynasties, what is a dynasty? We're going to be talking about two main dynasties today. Um, what, let's define what a dynasty is first. A uh, dynasty is a line of rulers belonging to the same family, meaning it was passed down along hereditary means from father to son. We'll talk about uh, a bit later about how this was passed along and the concept of the mandate of heaven. But uh, the two dynasties that we're going to talk about are the Shang and the Zhao. The Shang, if you look at the years here, uh, 1600 to uh, 1046 BC, one family in control of the country for 550 years about. And the Zhao, sorry, I kind of crossed it off there. But the Zhao is controlled for 800 years. Think about the U.S. has barely been around as a country um, for like 200 years. And one, one family was controlling China for 800 years. Pretty crazy, I know. Now let's talk about the Shang Dynasty. And the story of Oracle Bones is actually pretty interesting, how the Oracle Bones uh, came about and how they began to be studied. In ancient Chinese medicine, uh, bones have been used for centuries. Basically, people go and like, crush up bones. And when they crush up the bones, they'd use them in medicine. They'd, they'd eat them. They have some medicinal properties. And in the very late 1800s, um, someone basically went and was going to be crushing up these, these bones uh, for medicinal purposes. And they went and they looked and they saw writing on it. And from that, we kind of saw the concept which historians began to study of oracle bones. So let me explain what divination is and what these oracle bones were used for. Divination is essentially what we call fortune telling or predicting the future. With oracle bones, they would take the bones of, a, of an ox or a turtle, and they would actually ask certain questions to the ancestors of their gods. They would ask, uh, should we go to war, what the weather will be like, something along those lines. Then they would go, they actually say who the person doing the reading was as well. They'd carve that into the oracle bone. Then they go, they heat up the oracle bone, and then it would split, put it against a hot piece of metal, and it would split. And they'd read the different lines, the way the bone split, and that can be interpreted in different ways. It's kind of like a palm reading today. If they got the reading correct, they would go and uh, inscribe later when it came true. If not, I'd probably threw it in a ditch or something like that. But ever since then, th we've gone and historians have been able to read these oracle bones, and we can learn a ton of info about the uh, ancient Chinese civilization. So the capital was at the city of Yin, which served the Shang Dynasty for the last uh, about 250 years, including the tomb of Fu Hao. Fu Hao was a woman, and I'm going to show you the tomb here. Pretty, the tomb's pretty nuts because when we go and look inside, there's hundreds and hundreds of just objects, very, very wealthy. In addition, we find uh, six dog skeletons, which people always get sad when I say that. They killed the dogs and put it there in, her, uh, in the tomb with her. And also 16 human skeletons, slave skeletons as well, uh, to serve her as well. Now, politics, how do they rule? Well, there's basically a king in charge of the Shang Dynasty, and the king would have total control over the region. And the king, in addition to um, having kingly powers, also had powers related to the oracle bone. So when we look at the king, the king was actually the chief oracle bone reader, if that makes sense. In addition, the uh, military uh, was known for its use of the chariot, and the king would actually use, would actually be in battle with the, uh, the army as well. So with the military, they would easily crush any outside invaders, um, which wasn't much of a match uh, for them as well. Now, the story of the downfall is actually pretty interesting and funny. The story of the downfall, some of the later Shang uh, rulers become very, very wealthy. And they become very, very into vice and uh, drinking and parties and having these crazy parties at the palace. And one of the most famous stories is in the backyard of the palace, they, they built what's called the wine pool and meat forest. And in the backyard, they actually filled the pool up with wine, believe it or not, and they could go and go around the pool and drink the wine out of the pool. And in the middle, they had the meat forest, which is an island in the middle of the pool. And in the middle of the pool, they literally have kebabs or skewers that they would go to and eat the meat off the trees 
um, which is it's just ridiculous. It's cr- incredibly opulent. Obviously, this is very expensive, so they had to increase the taxes. Didn't they make the people so hot to see when you're starving that your ruler has a backyard um, pool with wine and meat just hanging out of trees, kind of like Willy Wonkaville? So uh, that's going to lead to the downfall of the Shang Dynasty. So taking a look here, you can see the um, this is an example of an oracle bones and some of the inscriptions as well. Like I said, it would be used for the process of divination. In addition, these this is in the early, uh, actually mid-1970s, they found the tomb of Fu Hao, and there's the excavations going on. We'll take a look here in a second. And here's the tomb of Lady Fu Hao. If you look here to the side, if you can see that, that's actually one of the human skeletons, some of the slaves that they would have, uh, basically for the afterlife or something along those lines. Now this picture, if you get the Indiana Jones, uh, the second movie, the, the reference, the last ruler of the Shang Dynasty, his uncle uh, started to turn against him. And the ruler said, essentially, um, Uncle, you are so smart, you're so wise, um, let's show the people the heart of a wise man. And they had his heart literally ripped out of his body, and they went and hung it outside the palace to show people. So don't mess with the ruler of the Shang Dynasty, as you can tell. And here is uh, a big old pit of just a bunch of oracle bones uh, that are just sitting there. Now what I'm going to talk about, we're going to be tr- transitioning uh, to the Zhao Dynasty and kind of some of the concepts they, they brought along with them. The first one is the Mandate of Heaven. The Mandate, and another word for a mandate would be something along long lines of order, like the order of heaven, meaning that heaven is in control of your destiny. If you are in control in China and your family is in control, uh, the heavens, the gods, basically want you to be in control. And if you start to lose control, say there was like a flood or an earthquake, that means the gods are displeased. And if you look at the Xiao Dynasty, I mean, they're in control for a long time. But the idea here is that we kind of think, okay, if someone says that they're talking to the gods, they're probably pretty nuts. But in a sense, this actually kept them in check because if stuff started to go wrong, people would think that the gods were displeased with them. So it almost serves as a check on, on power. Uh, the Mandate of Heaven, basically the, some of the ideas behind it was that there was one ruler of China and that the ruler of China was, was chosen by heaven. And in order to maintain the rule of heaven, you had to maintain proper virtue and ruling justly. So it's basically a, a kind of idea to, to instill honor upon the rulers. In addition, they set a kind of standard of feudalism, which you may have th- thought about as a system in, the, in medieval Europe, which they, they do have in medieval Europe. But basically, if you think about, say you're the ruler of the, the Zhao dynasty, you have all of China. China's huge. You're not going to be able to go and rule it all yourself. So you're going to have to divide it among different people. And those people will provide you troops, you'll provide them troops, and these people that work for you are essentially going to rule the land and collect taxes through the form of uh, farming, maybe providing troops as well. Castration was a common punishment for both adultery and rape, and uh, very cruel. So what uh, this kind of transitions here into the idea of the five punishments, which I'll spend a couple of minutes on. The five punishments depended upon social class, which you should see a parallel between uh, this and Hammurabi's Code. The five punishments depended uh, upon, like, if you were a serf, a woman, or a slave. Some of the favorite punishments that I'll talk about, and co- of course, castration. Um, killing somebody, they would include uh, boiling somebody alive, slicing them to death until they bled to death. Uh, tying a, a rope around their four limbs, and they would tie the rope to four horses, and then kick the horses until your rims lift up, lip, ripped out of your body, which is pretty brutal. Uh, in addition, they would send you an exile. They would kick you out of the city. Um, they would kill you through strangulation. Um, they would force women to commit suicide. I mean, all of these things are fairly rough. So that's the idea of the five punishments. Pretty rough, but in this unit, as you saw with Hammurabi's Code, uh, life is rough, and Hammurabi's Code is pretty rough as well. So there you go. Ancient China, our final civilization.